And I invite you to consider maybe turning away or turning aside and away from the screen or just turning a little to the side so that your, your gaze can be open. We're gonna do some eye open meditation here, which might be new to you, but when you'll see what it's like, we'll see together. So once you're comfortable on your cushion, you start by taking three deep cleansing breaths. Cleansing breath, a kind of clearing out with our breath of the stale energy in the body. We'll just take a deep inhale, filling the belly, the chest, the lung. And on our exhale, we're breathing out slowly and deeply, nice and slow, slow deep exhale. and. We get to what we think is the bottom. We're gonna actually press out the rest of the air. So we're just pressing out every last drop of air. And at the end of that, you're gonna to wanna to inhale. So go with it, inhaling deeply, belly breath. Filling the lower belly, mid belly, chest, lungs. And the slow, deep exhale. And at the very end, pressing the belly in to press out the last drops of air. And the third deep inhale. And deep, full, slow exhale. Cleaning out the stale energy of the body. And coming back to a gentle breath. The breath, breathing, you. possible right now that your eyes are closed. Which is fine. Start that way. Coming down into the feeling body, especially down to the base of the body, where your body meets the cushion or the chair, or if your sensation ends somewhere in the upper body, as it does for some, wherever the lowest part of your feeling body is resting there close to the earth. Letting this solid anchored body 
ground of fighting mind. Now gradually moving up the body with your attention. To where the belly is rising, falling with the breath. This natural ocean-like inhale, like the wave swelling. And this gentle, soft exhale, like a wave falling. This natural flow. Breath like an ocean. Letting attention move up the body. into the eyes and gradually just a little opening the eyes, keeping the gaze soft. Not focusing on any one thing, but keeping the gaze panoramic and open. If you're new to open-eyed meditation, it might be at first it's distracting the tendency to want to grab onto something you see. When you notice that tendency, just a deep, slow exhale and letting go into sky-like openness. Mind like the sky.
Noticing when the eyes are open, expansive like this. Things don't stop. This breath still breathes. These thoughts still flow. The breeze in the room or outside still moves. But just like the clouds don't harm the sky, these movements don't harm the openness of your awareness. And noticing how there's a part of the mind that may want to manage the practice. Maybe a part of the mind that says, maybe you should sit a little bit straighter. Maybe you should breathe a little more deeply. Maybe you need to push these thoughts away. And when you notice, just again, a deep, full exhale. And permission to let go. Let be just as it is. Awareness 
open. Gentle. Great. Sometimes, with the gaze open, the mind open, the heart open, the smaller managing self wants to find something to do. Isn't there more to do? And when you notice, just releasing, letting the manager self lay back and join you in this open, panoramic case. Coming home to your open, loving awareness of things just as they are.
And now we can move our fingers, our toes. And the neck, move the little side to side. Moving from stillness into gentle movement. And I'd like to invite us to stand up together. And we're not going to take a full break, but we're going to take a short communal stretch break. And of course, you can use this time if you need to, to use the facility. I'm going to have a stand up here. This is a good way to segue also after practice. Just Standing up and reaching, maybe grabbing a wrist. And on an exhale, it's a gentle bend to the side. And inhaling up. Exhaling, gentle bend to the side. And again, inhaling up, grabbing the other wrist and gentle bend to the side. On an exhale, half moon stretch. And inhaling up, gentle bend to the side. And then stretching up tall, 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 up to the ceiling as tall as you can get. And on an exhale, we're gonna swan dive over. This is just getting a nice stretch in the hips, stretch in the back. And just wherever you fall, you fall dangling, then in the head dangle towards the earth. The hands relax. And turning the head from side to side, a little swaying from side to side. Nice stretch in the back of the leg. And we'll slowly roll up one vertebrae at a time. Very good. And coming back again to our seats. Waking up the body. <laughs> so this practice that we just did together is maybe very familiar to you, depending on your background, where you came from. Um, and for some of you, you may not be used to something that loose and open. So this is a practice, essentially, it's a practice of letting go of the managing and the doing, <laughs> which in itself is a really steep practice. <laughs> it's deep. It's a steep road. And I was thinking back just when I was uh, coming online this morning, uh, this afternoon, early afternoon here, I was thinking about um, my early training in this practice. And I was in my 20s and uh, in a retreat situation, my 
my teacher, I come into our long retreat and said, uh, said, okay, we're going to spend a month. And we were all, you know, anticipating the instruction. What are we going to spend our month doing? We are in multi-year retreat. And of course, up until that point in the retreat, we'd been uh, told that we were always going to be doing something. Okay, now you're going to do this ritual. You're going to ring this bell. You're going to chant these mantras. You're going to do, <laughs> there's a lot of doing. And here are the steps, right? That had been the trajectory of our practice. So so our teacher came down and, and, he, and we asked him what we we're going to be doing for the month. And he said, I want you to do nothing. <laughs> we were all just, I, that, that can't be, can't be what you mean. He said, no, no, that's it. Meditation is doing nothing. And that was my introduction to this practice was the <laughs> instruction from my teacher. And, you know, I took it into my room to do, to practice. We were doing a lot of solitary practice and sat on the cushion and immediately noticed how hard it was to let go of this doing, doing mind. And to actually let go of doing for once and just be present with what is and participate in the flow. I didn't even have these words that I'm using right now. Participate in the flow, right? <laughs> 22 years old or whatever. Uh, but the idea of doing nothing, I quickly discovered that nothing, doing nothing is very hard to do. And uh, so, but yes, it is very hard to do. But why, why do we need to do it? Why do we need to learn to do nothing? Doing nothing is hard to do. Why do we need to learn to do nothing? So that's a question that I'm going to um, bring to this talk. It's a short talk. I'm just going to talk for a little bit. We do in this Sangha Live, about a half hour practice, half hour talking, reflecting, and then a half hour of discussion with you, which I'm really looking forward to. So this practice is a practice of letting go of the managing of our experience. That's what it means to do nothing. Uh, kind of like letting go of steering the boat on the waves of this turbulent mind and instead getting into the water and resting, uh, laying on the surface and, and letting the flow of our experience take us and participating in the flow. And so that's very easy to say, but it's actually quite difficult to do because there's just this very strong part of us, say the managing self that wants to change our experience, wants to improve our experience just a little bit or doesn't like parts of our experience and wants to get rid of those parts. And the Buddha talked about this as attachment and aversion. These tendencies that we have to push away some of our experience and to bring other parts of our experience near. And now we might think, well, that's what's wrong with that. You know, what's wrong with improving my lot in life? What's wrong with making things better? What's wrong with getting rid of my enemies and putting them far away? Why, why can't I Push the, push the bad stuff away. Shouldn't I be pushing it away? Now that would be fine if it worked, right? If it worked. But, but actually what we're doing, according to the Buddha, and I think according to our own reflection as we begin to look in at our own patterns and our own tendencies, we're actually acting on this very deep part of the self that is just subtly discontent. That it isn't that the conditions around us are difficult and that some of the conditions are 
easy. It's that there's a part of the self that is slightly discontent. That's mixed into the picture. That is slightly um, unhappy and, and seeking a cure for that unhappiness. The Buddha called this dukkha, that we all have dukkha. We all have this inner discontent. And so our struggle <laughs> is endless to improve our situation. And actually a lot can be done on the inside with seeking contentment, but not from the conditions outside the self, but rather from the orientation from inside the self. That it's actually possible to develop an internal sense of comfort with things just as they are. And that we can come much closer to the joy, the happiness that we seek when we find that inner contentment. And so practice is much about that. It's about developing a container, if you will, the sense of this body-mind that is accessing resources within that provide balance and comfort and ease and joy and being able to dance with the conditions when they arise. Practice is this reorienting of the gaze on our experience. And so we are, what we're doing in this particular practice that we just did together here is learning to participate in the flow of our experience without managing it. And, and when we do that, when we step back from the managing and we enter into the spaciousness and the openness of what is right here and right now, we discover that actually what's right here and right now is incredibly rich. And what is right here and right now is actually mirroring back to us something that we primordially have as our birthright. What all of this is mirroring back to us is our own awareness, if you will. So it's not just that we're seeing the world, right? We are not just that we're seeing the plants and the butterflies and the sky and our, the room that we're in here and maybe the books on our bookshelf, but we're actually seeing this field that is coextensive with the one who is observing it. So we might say that Nothing that we see, taste, touch is separate from the one who is seeing, tasting, and touching. And so with a practice of openness like this, we're actually capable of encountering our awareness in a very direct and very non-dual, if you will, way. We are encountering the depth. We're not just encountering the world. We're encountering the depth of the one who is perceiving that world. And so that kind of, so I may mean, sound kind of theoretical and philosophical. Um, but that's the practice that I wanted to share with you today.
a practice of opening and letting go of this of this managing mind in order to see what else is there when we do that. Because I think we think that the managing mind is the truest part of ourselves sometimes, right? Our name, our identity, um, the one who controls everything, the one, <laughs> the pilot, you know, we think that the pilot who is directing everything is our true self. But actually the tradition of Buddhism tells us that is a construction, that that self is, is a social construction, it's a cultural construction, and it's changing. It's not um, something solid and not something reliable in one sense. It's, it's um, enduring in the sense of day to day, but it's in flow over the course of a lifetime. Like the structure that we had when we were 10 or 11 is not the structure that we have when we're 40 or 50. The structure of the self changes radically over our lifetime. That, that self that we might call the managing self, the one who is the director of our life story, <laughs> the director in the director's seat. But what our practice tells us and what the Buddha told us is there's actually a truer part of this body-mind, this self, whatever you would call it, um, in some traditions of Buddhism, that truer self has been called the selflessness, <laughs> the selflessness, that actually there's a part of us that is naturally selfless, and that that getting in touch with that part is a very profound encounter with a different sense of self, so to speak, a self that doesn't identify with that um, more solid construction, a self that recognizes the managing self as a construction. But other traditions, other parts of the Buddhist tradition call that deeper identity, if you will, awareness and meaning that yes, there is this constructed, this managing kind of self, but also there is just this bare, naked, aware one, if you will, like a capital A, aware, capital O, the aware one who is just seeing in a very simple present moment way, just tasting, just being, and who isn't managing, but is present and open to everything that is coming in. That part of us is awareness, and awareness follows us all the time. It's like the lamp that doesn't have to be lit, right? We don't have to think when we wake up in the morning, oh, I am going to become aware, right? <laughs> it's just happening. We're just aware. And it is a miracle every time we wake up that we're there and we're just aware. And then the thinking mind gets going and the thinking mind is, is quite a different thing. But the just aware, awareness, is this part of the self that is very quiet. And it's like the backdrop of that managing construction. And the backdrop is very spacious and very open and very childlike and in a state of wonder and in some ways, as we grow up, that kind of shuts down. But as we begin to practice meditation, that wakes up again. It's like that child within is finally given permission to just be here now, finally, and to not do. So the not doing, coming back all the way around to that uh, story I told in the beginning of this teaching, when I was a new student of Buddhism, and my teacher said, your task is to not do anything. Your task is to do nothing. Coming back all the way around to that, when we actually do nothing or we give ourselves permission to do nothing, the manager gets to relax for the first time, maybe in 50 years, right? How long, it depends on when we're introduced to this practice. 
But then finally, like, oh, permission to let go. And when we let go, the amazing thing is we don't disappear. And we also don't dissolve into chaos. But at first, I think most of us are afraid that's what's going to happen. I think I was afraid at some subtle level. We're afraid that if we really let go, we might dissolve into chaos, right? Dissolve into the chaos of our own mind and our own thoughts. What if I really let go? But actually, when we really let go, we discover we are held. We are held in this field of wakeful, steady awareness. And it is very stable. And it is very open. And it is very free. But we can't really find that part if all we're doing is managing our experience 24-7. So we have to actually learn how to stop managing our experience and start being in the flow of our experience in order to discover this wakeful awareness. And so somehow in, <laughs> in designing um, the course that I'm about to teach for Sangha Live and also in, in the titling this talk, I decided to call it loving awareness because it isn't just that awareness is aware, that awareness is also very tolerant of everything that's arising, right? Just by nature, if you're resting in awareness that is seeing, tasting, smelling, and you're not managing what you're experiencing, you're in this relationship with this part of yourself that is not only radically tolerant of everything, but actually loves everything as it is, that is capable of embracing what is coming towards it without othering, without pushing away, and without grasping and bringing toward. That's a very loving stance on our experience. So I decided to call it loving awareness because I think sometimes when we're introduced to a practice like this that is so open and that is so connected to um, the teachings of, of non-dual practice, we may think that this is just a very, it's, we're looking at emptiness or we're seeing um, words like things as they are, words like emptiness, <laughs> shunyata. It's a Sanskrit word that describes this open quality of our experience. Um, when we're introduced to those words, we might think that we're developing some kind of cold clinical gaze on our experience that has no feeling to it, no feeling tone. But actually, there's a really strong feeling tone to awareness, and it's joyful, easeful, and loving. And so sometimes that gets lost, I think, in the, in the teachings on non-dual awareness. So I wanted to, to, to bring that into the fore, that it's not just an open awareness, it's also a loving awareness. And it's something that we can find within. And when we do find that within ourselves we're also touching into something that we know intuitively, empathetically is also in others. So to encounter it in ourselves is to encounter that potential in each and every person that we meet, that underneath all the stuff on top that seems very complex and might seem very um, complicated and maybe very rough and hard to deal with, that underneath that is also their loving awareness. And we can actually learn in practice and in taking our practice into a relational field to connect to the loving awareness in others and to begin to commune with them underneath the uh, rougher parts or underneath the so-called personality. And that that's one of the ways that the Dharma is such a beautiful, um, uh, we could say avenue towards graceful relationship through that doorway of awareness. So those are a few thoughts that I have today on loving awareness and a bit of practice. 
in that direction. But I really want to open it up now to all of you and to hear from you, what was that like to practice in that way, if you'd like to share that? Or do you have any questions for me? But maybe right before we do have the q and A, I I did wanna say just a word about Donna. So I was asked to maybe say a few words about that. And it's interesting because I haven't really before. And so I appreciate the invitation um, because it is an unusual practice. It's not a practice that we really have in the West, a practice of, um, or maybe we do, yeah, in some um, churches and that kind of thing, we have a, an, a tradition of giving. In the Buddhist tradition, it started with the Buddha's first disciples who, um, who actually walked around and collected alms to support their practice. It was the very first um, practice of dana was the lay people giving the monks alms. And even though we're not monks as Dharma teachers, we do rely on your support to keep teaching. And so that practice of dana can be um, a small gift um, in any way that you would like to provide it. And I just wanted to thank you in advance for that, uh, any support you can offer. Thank you. And so now we can open it up to, um, and, and Mar uh, Marley will tell you how to do that. We can open it up to the group for questions or sharing. And I may look over here now and then because I'm bringing up the gallery view so I can see you. Uh, so I see, let's see, Ruth has raised a hand and I'll just call on you in the order that I see you down here. Let's see if I can figure out if that's the order that you raised your hand. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, lovely Hi. to see you. Hi. Hi. Um, you look like you're somewhere very nice and hot. <laughs> it's snowing here. <laughs> so, um, I just, I'm really interested in this idea of doing nothing. Um, I grew up in a very different age from my teenage son, where doing nothing was uh, something that I spent a lot of time doing, lying on my bed and dreaming and just being. And, and of course, now with phones and I see no space for this um, experience just as a young person and realize that when now as an older person, I'm still I'm drawing on that experience that I had as a young person, the richness of that. And I just wondered if you had anything to say about how we could support younger people, given that th this is the way they live and um, to just touch on that experience themselves given that we we you know we live in a very digital age they have phones they have um yeah, i'm a musician my you know it's like you know it's not like we're growing up in a completely mad phone place but that's how that's how the young kids are and that's how it is and um just wondered if you had any thoughts on that about the beauty mm -hmm. of doing nothing for teenagers mm -hmm. these days yeah Yes. Well, I found it really useful, the, the concept of a technology Sabbath. Um, it's a technology Sabbath or a technology um, Sabbath, meaning a, a, a holy break, a holy, a holy a rest, a holy rest, a day of holy rest. And so, you know, how we frame our relationship to these devices can really help us um, find space from them. So if we understand our time away as a Sabbath, or if you will, or a, um, a holy break, <laughs> a sacred break from those devices and give ourselves a time when we turn everything off, maybe even as a family, like a whole family turning off all of our devices, all your devices and, and, and just spending a day together, uh, making and making meals and taking walks as a practice. 
that can be very powerful. For me, that's been powerful. I don't have kids, but as a single person teacher, <laughs> just having days where I turn everything off and I'm just not in touch with any of it, uh, go off, go dark for a day and see that as my Sabbath um, can be very helpful. You look, you look uncertain. No, I'm not uncertain. Um, I'm just, <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem possible, actually. So it, um, given... it, it takes dis discipline. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and, and it, it would have to be cooperation with your, you know, your son would have to want to do that, of course. But, but finding, um, finding time when you both decide, let's do this, could be could be powerful. Okay. I'm just going to take that away and it has to be agreed with the whole family, which is very hard. But, could be, um, could be. Yeah, yeah. See, see. Yeah, well, who knows yeah. until you try, right? Try and approach it as a positive, like rich, like what kind of rich things could we think up to do together without this stuff around? You know? okay. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. If you would like, I can let you know who's next in the queue. There's that would a, be great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Anne, I'm going to bring Anne on now. Yes. Hi. This is my first time sitting with you. I first heard you talk through Tergar through their interview with you, and I really enjoyed this morning so far. Um, you've talked a lot about learning how to stop managing our experience this morning. And maybe you've already answered this, but I'm so curious about what triggers that decision in us to wish to manage, to stop managing our experience. What's, how do we think about, talk about that part of ourselves and how do we trigger that? Does that make sense as a question? How do we trigger the stopping of the managing? No, how do we trigger the choice, the intention to even want to stop managing, to even recognize that maybe that could be something worthwhile? I mean, I can feel it. I think whatever that is, is what drew me to the Dharma in the first place. But how do we think about it? Does that, mm -hmm. am I groping, groping in the dark? Right. Something very subtle, yeah. Well. Yeah, no, I'm so that's a great question. Anne. and I think um, we often we may not. OK, we don't know the payoff of practice until we practice. I think sometimes we don't know the payoff until we practice. So we don't know the once we know the upside of letting go of that part of the self, what can be discovered in that amazing field of freedom? where we're not controlling, mm -hmm. we're not controlling anymore. And until we taste what it's like to stop controlling, mm -hmm. we wanna keep controlling. And we may think it's the only way. So we need to, um, I think there's a, a willingness that we, we need to practice the Dharma which is a willingness to play. And, and, and the spirit of play is very much in line with the Dharma, which means the willingness to try on a different ways of being that we haven't tried before. Almost like we're experimenting. Uh, we are scientists in the field of consciousness what would it be like if I stopped trying to control everything in my life? And even in my moment, <laughs> not just my life, what if I stopped trying to control the moment and stop trying to resist the moment or stop trying to make the moment better? What would happen? <laughs> and then once we do that, we're like, oh, that is really kind of cool. That feels good and different. And there's something to be learned from that. So I would just say the spirit of play. If we enter the spirit of play, 
then it's then it's easy to let go easier maybe and is this some part of ourselves that perhaps is very wise that is calling to us to experiment i think that? so there's a part maybe that mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think that um someone said in the chat play and curiosity i just wanted to flag that word curiosity as they add on there that's also really important to be curious about our experience and how we how we are with our experience is the key to encountering awareness and yes that awareness is calling to be known it wants to be known by us just like we might say the buddha wants to be known by us the buddha wants to know us and we want to know it her him it that encounter is not only is there a force drawing us to that encounter but it's inevitable that we will encounter and that is a because it's our true nature it's inevitable our true nature is we are coming home to our true nature whether we fully realize that or not it's a force in us that is primordially there and present and it's something we've known before it's not like something new we think it's new we think it's we are going to know it anew it's more like a homecoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I can feel that when you're talking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now is, I hope I say this correctly, Shika. Hello, nice to see you again. Um, nice to see you, Shika. I am. Um, do you feel like um, you had mentioned this um, capacity we all have to recognize um, the loving awareness, as you said, um, within within each other and within ourselves? And I um, wonder if this kind of uh, thing that we, this hierarchical tendency that we have to, as people to, um, to put people in, in sort of certain categories like teacher and student, and um, whether that inhibits our capacity to really recognize one another as we are. I think that all categories can potentially be limiting, right? Could they be limiting? It could be limiting. And awareness is the great, a great equalizer because we all have it. We all have it. So roles exist in our in our relative world it seems like right that we we inhabit them kind of like we we live in a in a temporary dwelling and and our roles change from day to day right we might be in the role of student one day and a role of teacher and mentor the next day as to someone we're a mentor and to someone else we're a mentee or maybe to ourselves we feel that way in different roles or we may be um, a daughter in one relationship and a mother in another and a sister in another so our our relational roles change but we share that that awareness it's like a great equalizer so there's something very um, bonding about that. 
Very what? Bonding. Bonding. Oh, okay. Bonding. Yeah. Yeah. Just about about a that practice a practice of awareness is a practice of, of intimacy with others and beyond the roles. Next is Victoria. Yes, hello. Thank you for your guidance today and your talk. Um, this is probably a much, much too huge a question for this setting, <laughs> but, but it's burning in my mind, so I have to put it out there. Um, I'd love to have a, an opportunity to discuss with you further. Um, I, I find myself um, confused about the and even in your talk, um, this is not a criticism, it's just, it's just like my mind trying to put it all together, talking about the self, I mean, there's no self, and then you're saying the part of our self, and then you say the no, it, this self versus non-self, and um, the non-dual aspect, which I understand in the sense of that, like, or like what Thich Nhat Hanh called interbeing, I think he, he coined that phrase, I don't know, but um, that sense that we're all connected and interconnected. And in that sense, the loving awareness, um, I think, is a really appropriate and beautiful uh, idea to, to sort of build our practice on. And yet at the same time, um, I'm wondering, because because my most of my uh, study of Buddhism has been in a secular context, a Western context. Um, and so I'm confused. I, I feel like there, I feel like it sometimes when it, is is presented in in kind of this Western vipassana or whatever tradition. But you come from the Tibetan, I think. Anyway, this is way too huge, and I know other people want to ask questions. So, um, <laughs> but I'd love to really dig deeply into this with you. Um, how you see um, the like this this understanding of the non-self and versus the self or the interbeing aspect of the non-dual mm -hmm. aspect within the context of a, um, does that presuppose a kind of uh, deistic background somewhere? Like um, even when you said, will the, to get to know the Buddha and then you said he, she, or it, or the Buddha. Um, because I know that Bo the Buddhism range in the world goes from extremely secular, like the kind of um, John Kabat-Zinn kind of um, model to very, very devotional and very religious in the, like, especially I think in the Tibetan tradition. So already that for me is interesting because I don't see that in other traditions, uh, like spiritual traditions. And even like the word spiritual, how does it work? I don't know. I, anyway, I'm, I'm not articulate at all. <laughs> if you can make some kind of sense out of what I'm asking and say something profound, I'll be grateful and then leave it for another time. <laughs> I can't promise saying something profound, but <laughs> <laughs> I can, I could, I, I, first of all, just appreciate your question, Victoria. And I think that um, it's a very pertinent question to many people here, undoubtedly. Buddhism is, so there's no Buddhism, there's Buddhism. And there's so many Buddhisms. There's many Buddhisms as there are Buddhists. I mean, Buddhism is a very complex and diverse and open and interweaving and very culturally um, rich tradition. And there are many, many infinite. In fact, the more you study Buddhism, the more conflicting statements you will see in the Buddhist uh, canon. And so, um, it seems like, oh, but I read this here, but I read this over here. It totally contradicts it. And sometimes you're absolutely right. Those two things are a contradiction. And sometimes there's a paradox that is being held. So it is really interesting that two truths can exist together. Two truths. Even the Buddha talked about two truths, a relative truth and ultimate truth. So that two, two different things can exist together. And um different dimensions of perception can exist together so so i just want to point out that yes it can be quite confusing and complex what i could say just off the top of my head is one thing that is shared 
by all of the Buddhist traditions is, I would say, placing a value. <laughs> Someone is not muted there. We're hearing you, Emma. <laughs> placing a value on um, on developing a practice of inner awareness, self-awareness, if you will, uh, selfless awareness, self-awareness, <laughs> selfless awareness, awareness of what's going on with the body mind and um, an inner gaze. In fact, in Tibetan, the word Buddhist means nangpa, is nangpa, which means someone who, who gazes inside. That's actually the word for a Buddhist, the one who gazes inside. And I think what we could say about Buddhist traditions is that they all share this value, uh, placing a value on slowing down and gazing to see what's what's there, what's there, um, not just on the outside, but on the inside. So I could say that's one thing that we all share in common. What we call that, what we call we, what we see, we might call it um, awareness. We might call it when, when we say what we see, what we see behind the curtain. We might call it um, shunyata which means something like open dimensionality. We might call it Buddha nature. We might call it um, selflessness. These are all words used in the tradition. And um, and that is also a shared, we could say a shared value in the Buddhist tradition is looking behind the curtain of the thinking mind to see what's present and, and what the name given to what's present differs from from tradition tradition within the sub traditions of Buddhism. So it can be confusing. And um, there would be yeah, we don't have that much time. So I'm not going to go too much more into that. But just what a great question. And I, I just encourage you on your exploration and just um, stay staying open and curious and seeing what you learn. It's a very exciting journey that you're on. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you have time for any more? We have a couple yeah, more. Yeah, I know I could take, yeah. Let me take a couple more. Just those two more, let's say. Ayachita. Yeah. Hi. Um, yes, great. Uh, a very, a very happy to meet you. And uh, my my uh, practice is blockchain as well as um, movement improvisation. So the, the, the sense of play and all that is very familiar to me. So, so many things in your talk were very rich. One thing that stood out to me was uh, when you talked about awareness and uh, as I understood it, you talked about awareness as being mirrored back in a non-dual way in the, in the world. And something like that. And, um, you know, awareness sometimes seems so subtle that it's just like, well, where is it? Where is it? And I just love the way you talked about it. It's something very, here it is, you know, it's here, right? Something to be perceived in a non-dual way. Um, and I, I just wondered whether you could say a little bit more on that, especially in relation also maybe to you know, the pain in the world, you know, seeing the war, seeing so many people suffering and how that mirrors in a way is mirroring back awareness as well. So I'd be really interested in that. Yeah, well, starting with the suffering, you know, just, um, yeah, just one thing we can do now because we're together is just, just bring to mind the suffering of the war. Uh, in Ukraine and part of our practice in Dzogchen or in awareness practice or in Buddhist practice is leaning towards, leaning in, leaning towards that, not the, you know, turning away um, and um, including those who are suffering in our practice. And we can, we do that explicitly when we dedicate um, and we do that explicitly when we give rise to bodhicitta in the beginning of practice. Um, it's very important, actually, that our that our Dzogchen practice, our as it is practice, be balanced by practices of 
of loving awareness and that um, in which we open our hearts to the suffering of others and recognize that our practice, we're, we're not doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for the world. And just opening to that suffering helps us remember why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I practicing? Mm. And you know, why, why bother? Because the world needs it and needs us to be holding the light of sanity, peace, a commitment to peace, and a commitment to recognizing the sacredness of, of life, of each other, of one another. That is the practice of Dzogchen. We're looking, we're seeing the sacredness here. We're seeing the sacredness in others. How could we do anything to harm them, right? Wouldn't it be, it would be a better world right, if we all could practice like mm. that. So, mm. yeah, so just you know, let's bring them to mind. Let's, let's dedicate, and you know, when we dedicate, at the end, let's let's do a little dedication and include include them. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I could say more, um, but uh, but just to say, awareness is not somewhere out there. It's not somewhere in the future. Awareness is always here now, and there, and we won't find it anywhere else. Hmm. And, and in some ways, it could say that the deepest practice is the practice that recognizes that what we've been seeking all along is present in what is happening right here, right now. Mm. And at first, that seems theoretical. But as we practice with it, it becomes less theoretical and more um, more obvious. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Jaya Chita. Nice to meet Berlin. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Henry. I wish to acknowledge it's 1 30 for the Sangha, but I we do have one more hand up. And I don't know if we have time. Yes, great. Henry, I'm gonna bring you on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Willa. Um, I'll try and keep it super quick. Um, just to say it's immensely um, powerful to have that acknowledgement that um, our meditative awareness needn't be a very cold and clinical and uh, controlling approach, which is, I think, where my practice can go when I'm not careful. Um, it's certainly empowering to have this sense that if we just let things alone a little bit, what is there already is, is an inherently loving approach. Um, my question is, you talked about the potential for us to grow and in, inner resources to be able to, to bring that loving awareness to, um, to our experience. I just wondered if you could speak very quickly about some of the other paths or dimensions or aspects that we might explore in building those inner resourcing. Okay. I would say those inner resources built by practices of love and compassion, uh, self-compassion in particular, and attention to the um, uniqueness of our individual stories and our individual traumas, turning towards those and healing ourselves while we do this work of awareness. And I think sometimes that gets uh, swept aside in in some Buddhist contexts is not as important. It's oh, it's central. You know, it's just central to do the work of our um, of growing into relationship with what has happened to us as individuals, unique individuals who've been through a lot, each one of us, and and learning to move into those stories and how to carry them. Uh, how to in, how to awaken and unburden what's already present in us, and not uh, bypass it, not step over it, not walk around it, not put the dharma on top of it, and instead to befriend it, and love it, and heal it. Uh, that's what I would say. Yeah, it's an important important for you and for us all, and us all. And uh, thank you. And. Um, and it's so wonderful, just, just a joy to be with everyone. And I would love to invite you 
to join me in, in the course this month, if you'd like, and it's called Loving Awareness. And you're welcome to join at this point if you want to. Um, it's not too late. And the nice thing about the course, I just want to mention it because some of us are like, wait, I'm way too busy this month to do anything, is that a lot of it is pre, these, there are pre-recorded sessions and that those can be revisited. And the sessions that are live, there's just four over the course of the month. So it's not a lot of live sessions. And you can, um, you can follow the course uh, live or you can watch the course later. You could do the live sessions now and then follow the course later. And um, for myself, it's the, I don't know how, maybe seventh course I've offered through Song Alive. And I have to say, I just find the, the team, you guys, <laughs> amazing. And they actually show up at my doorstep and they work with me to develop these courses. And this is this one is the one that I feel the most, is the most um, complete actually of anything that I have yet offered, maybe because I've got practice over a few years of doing it. So um, we just love to see you and love to get to know you in the course and please join me. So that's all, a little plug for that and uh, take care. And let's take a moment of dedicating and if we could just join our hands at our heart or on our heart um, and take a moment to call to mind the beings in our life living, who are uh, suffering, needing our love, needing our good energy, and those who are suffering uh, in the war in Ukraine on both sides and the families of those people and just sending our heart, dedicating our practice today and whatever energy of goodness, love, and awareness we have brought to that practice to the benefit of all and especially those who are suffering. <laughs> 